Hey, Tourpreneurs, it's Mitch Bach. And just a quick note before we begin today's episode, Tourpreneur is currently sponsored by Google. We're thankful for their support of our community, and we are offering with them a completely free course helping you unlock the power and potential of Google's Things to Do program, which is specifically helping tour operators add their tours to Google in new ways that gives you new exposure and more direct bookings. To learn more, go to tourpreneur.com slash Google. And as always, show notes, more resources, links to our newsletter, our business coaching community, and so much more are available on tourpreneur.com. Now to the episode. Today's episode is brought to you by Checkfront, the booking platform trusted by over 5,000 tour and activity operators around the world. You can start your own free 21-day trial over at Checkfront.com. Welcome to the Tourpreneur Podcast. Travel industry veteran Shane Whaley will take you on a journey with fellow tourpreneurs, sharing their tips, ideas, insights, and success stories to inspire you to make your tour business the best it can be. And now, here is your host. Hello, and welcome to episode 100 of the Tourpreneur Podcast. My name is Rob Patingolo. I'm the host of the Trip Hacks DC podcast and special guest host of today's episode. Today, I have a guest that I think most listeners to this podcast are excited to hear from. It's Shane Whaley, the founder of Tourpreneur himself. If you're listening to this episode right now, it's because of the hard work and dedication that Shane has put into building it. And I'm going to ask him all about how he got this podcast all the way to 100 episodes and where it's going from here. So Shane, welcome to Tourpreneur. Thank you. It's an absolute honor and a pleasure and a privilege to be on the show. Well, of course, it's your show. I'm just the guest host. But I just want to say first, congratulations on 100 episodes. That is awfully impressive. It's come out of nowhere. Like a lot of podcasts, they, they make a big event when they get to 100. They get people to call in and leave messages. They run competitions. They do like a Zoom conferencing. But suddenly it was like last week, I'm like, oh, wow, we're almost at 100, which I guess is a good thing when you don't even see it coming. Yeah, it definitely snuck up quick. I think I was on episode number 32, and that was just, it feels to me, it feels like just yesterday. So 100 definitely got here quick. But I think it's worth saying for folks listening to the podcast who aren't podcasters themselves like you and I are, how big of a deal it is to get to 100. Because when you and I talk shop, you sometimes mention this term pod fade. So can, can you talk a little bit about pod fade and what it is and how you got through that? Yeah, absolutely. So pod fade, there is a stat out there that says the average life of a podcast is seven episodes before uh, a person gives up. And and there's quite a few reasons behind that. One, the technology is getting easier and there's a lower barrier now than ever before. In fact, I just read a report that last month saw more podcast episodes on Apple than ever before and podcast shows because it's getting easier to podcast. But What's not easy is building traffic, gaining traction, and it can be pretty depressing at the start. So if you're not a celebrity-led podcast, so let's say, for instance, Mr. Obama decided to have a podcast, well, he's instantly going to get millions of listeners. But when Shane Whaley does it, or Rob Patingalo, it's your mom, your your brother, your cousin, (laughs) etc. It's really slow when you start off. And I think a lot of people, like in anything else that's celebrity or media-driven I think I'll launch this podcast and I'm going to be an influencer right away and, and all of this. And no, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. And when you get to episode seven and you see that you're not as popular as you think you should be, a lot of people give up or they run out of steam because they haven't really sat and planned out what their show is going to be about. It's just kind of hit the, hit the record button and go. So to get to 100, uh, I'm not sure what the stat is. It may be out there somewhere. I wonder how many shows actually get to episode 100 because it is a lot of work uh, goes on behind the scenes to get there. Yeah, I don't know the exact stat, but I do know that I attended PodFest Expo in Orlando in March and there was a presentation by Rob Walsh, who's a big industry guy, and he's got all the stats. And I was sitting watching his presentation and looking at the numbers and he said, if you have this many episodes, you're in the top percentile. If you have this many downloads, you're in the top percentile. And I was watching that thinking, wow, Tourpreneur is a top podcast. This isn't just a little niche thing. This is one of the best of the best in all of podcasting. So congratulations on that for sure. Thank you. I appreciate it. It, It's been an interesting journey because 
it's very similar to actually running a tour. Like when you started your trivia tours, right, in DC, no one else was doing it. And it's like, there's that fear factor of, okay, is anyone going to be interested in this? Is anyone going to hand over cash to go on this? Are they going to leave me a lot of stinking reviews saying it was a waste of time? It's very, very scary when you launch something that hasn't really been done before. Yeah, definitely. So it's great that it worked out for sure. Yeah. Now, I, w- I want to say that in the excellent professional sounding voiceover that starts every episode, you describe yourself as a travel industry veteran. And obviously, for folks who have listened to the podcast, you've mentioned many of the companies you've worked for over the years. So you have all this experience. What made you decide that you were going to start Tourpreneur? I had just left Get Your Guide. And I had two great years as regional director there for the Americas. And they basically, we'd we'd grown so big. The New York office was big. I was up in Vermont running the team remotely, which everybody's doing now. But back two and a half, three years ago, whatever it was, was was quite a, a new thing. And they wanted me to move back to New York City. I didn't want to go back to the city. So I left Get You Get All on good terms. I'm still, you know good friends with all of them over there. And I thought, okay, what do I do now? I've worked at booking.com, secret escapes, get your guide. Do I go back to OTA? Do I want to go back doing something where I'm part of this virtual team? And I actually went back and spoke to some accounts, tours, activities, experiences, and said, what, what did you feel, what do you feel is missing out there for you in terms of support? And what came back was many tour operators saying, well, I'd love to know the story behind such and such tours or how they got started or how that operator overcame that challenge. No one out there is really doing it. Yes, we have a rival, but that's really a couple of times a year and you go to an event. But I wish there was a media just for us. And that really got me thinking. And also uh, operators were saying to me how isolated they felt, particularly operators who were not, say, for instance, in, in D.C., you've got quite an active association of tour guides and operators that probably get together and once a month and have some beers, et cetera. But in many cities, that that infrastructure is not in place. So many operators do feel like their spouses don't understand the challenges of the business. Their friends certainly don't. And they've got nowhere to go. And that just really gave me food for thought. And I thought, I've, I've been doing podcasts, hobby casts in other areas. Is there a room? And of course, I searched. I went online and I looked for podcasts that were interviewing tour operators. And there was a couple out there, but they were mainly kind of marketing ones and talking of pod faded they they've gone now actually the ones i saw at the time uh, and there's a whole lesson there we can touch on later on but i recognize that no one else is really doing this i think i can do a good job at it because i'm naturally very curious i wouldn't say i'm a top journalist or an interviewer i'm just nosy <laughs> and that's how tourpreneur was born yeah that's fascinating and i'm totally in the same boat i always want to know the story behind these things because nowadays it's so easy to practice this whole fake it till you make it thing yeah. that you never really know when someone is claiming that they're wildly successful, whether they are or whether they're just saying that they are and hoping that someday they will be. But I feel like Tourpreneur really pulls back the curtain. And maybe not everybody who appears on the show is willing to open up their financial books or something like that. But it really gives a good insight into how we all kind of started from the same place. And I think that's really valuable. Thank you. The numbers certainly reflect that, as does the feedback from people all over the world. You know, when I last look, Tourpreneur was listened to in over 110 countries. Incredible. So you mentioned that you worked at uh, Booking.com, big OTA. And wh- when I think of Booking.com, I think of hotels. That's just mm-hmm. immediately where I go. Did you do hotels when you worked there or did you do oh, yeah. tours and activities? No, not at all. I mean, tours and activities online, I left there in 2012, was not a thing at all. So most of my working life was actually in hotels. It was only tours and activities when I made the move over to Get Your Guide. However, what I will say is when I traveled, it was always about the experiences, the tours and the activities. Yes, when I worked at Booking, I got to stay in some gorgeous hotels with a good discount. But even then, it was not the hotel that made the experience or the holiday. It was what I saw, what I did, what I tasted, what I experienced. So I've always been a huge fan of tours and activities. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Because when I think back to my own travels, if someone says, hey, how was your trip to Scotland? The first thing I say is, oh, it was great. I did this food tour and I did this uh, architecture tour and they're both great. I don't you know, immediately say, oh, we stayed in a hotel and it had a sauna in it or whatever other amenities they have. So it's definitely the thing that immediately comes to mind for me. So is that where that passion came from for you too? Absolutely. And I'm, I'm someone when I travel and it can be frustrating for friends, that I want to experience a place as a local. So I love doing the the off-the-beaten-track kind of tours. 
Or back in the day, I would do it myself. I always remember the first time I went to Prague, I was not impressed with the main square because it was so touristy and commercial. And I just hopped on a bus, found some neighborhood and, and went drinking in all these bars, but was talking to locals in their poor English. And I had no check, of course, but trying to find out a little bit more how that city, how it ticks. And that's something that's always appealed to me. Yes, I will go to the Statue of Liberty. Don't get me wrong. I will do some of those landmark tours, but really it's the off the beaten track ones that I really enjoy. That's how I really feel you get to understand a place. So you decided you were going to start this thing. And one of the hardest things about starting a podcast or starting a business at all is deciding what you're going to name yourself. So I think we can probably guess what tourpreneur means or what two words it's a combination of. But how did you come up with that name and what other names were in consideration when you were deciding what to name yourself? Yeah, so the name I had in mind for a long time was actually it was going to be called the Travel Pro Show. Mm. And it's funny, in, in my office here, I still got all this, the uh, post-it notes up on the wall. I, I went through this whole exercise of starting the podcast and how it would look. And it was called the Travel Pro Show. But then I, I quickly discovered that there's a, it's a, a luggage company called Travel Pro. Mm -hmm. I thought, yeah, the last thing I need is some kind of litigation or having to change the name halfway through or whatever else. And then I, I thought about it even more and thought, well, Travel Pro is so broad. You can be a pilot and be in Travel Pro. You know, I right. mean, it, and then I just got thinking about tour operators and the majority of tour operators that I met are solopreneurs, mom and pops, side hustles. I thought, well, they're entrepreneurs. And then obviously the name tourpreneur came about. And I looked online thinking, well, someone's bound to have had that. And I think there was somebody with a Twitter tourpreneur, but I didn't see any, certainly the domain was available. And I just thought, well, from an SEO perspective, tourpreneur is probably not the best name to pick. You know, probably touroperatorpodcast.com <laughs> would have been much better, but not as much fun and not really encapsulating that every interview I have. If you look at this because you run a tour business yourself, you have to be an entrepreneur. Yeah, you, you are your happiest when you're leading the tour. That's your thing. But you still have to do the books, the marketing, everything else that, that comes with running a business. And that's where the name tourpreneur came from. Oh, that's cool. I think it would be interesting if listeners to this podcast could give us some feedback about whether they like Tourpreneur better than some of the other options that were considered. Although I do agree with you having a big corporation coming after you because your podcast uses the same name as their luggage. Not a fun experience I would want to have. Yeah. And the thing is, the chances are they wouldn't have come, but they will come if you get big. It's like if you use a pop star's bit of music on your podcast, chances are you're not going to get in trouble until the day you start making serious money and you get big and then bet your bottom dollar they're going to come after you. So you, you never know. And I think, I think tour, I'm happier with Tourpreneur myself because it really does encapsulate what we do, what the show is about. It is a business show. And I get a lot of emails from people who want to come on the show, but they're travel writers. And it's mm -hmm. like, well, that's not really what we're about. We're B2B. We're not B2C. So I think being called tourpreneur, hopefully for the vast majority of people get that this is a, a, a business podcast rather than a travel show. Yeah. So speaking of podcasts, you you decided the tourpreneur would be a podcast, but mm -hmm. it could have it could have been a lot of things. It could have been a YouTube channel. It could have been a blog. It could have been, I don't know, a book. So why did you pick a podcast? Why did you decide that that was going to be the main medium of communication for this? Purely because podcast is my favorite form of media. Mm. I listen to podcasts constantly. I listen to audio books. And I'm someone, I just learn more by listening. And there are some great documentaries and things on YouTube and even the webinars of late, the virtual one day seminar arrival hosted. I just found myself distracted. And that's not because of the content. It's just I'm sat in front of a computer. I'm twitching to check my social and everything else. And dogs are barking and whatnot. Whereas when I go out for my walk or I'm commuting, I'm really engaged fully in that form. Um, so that that was the principal reason. I think also I, I'd never really had experience of doing video before. And I, I you know, I'd never edited video or done any of that. I thought, do I really want to learn yeah. that format? Blogs, I do write blogs occasionally on Torpreneur. And I think that's that's actually one of the downsides with podcasts, to be honest with you, is you can write a blog post a day and people will consume it. And there are a million tour operators out there. So I could effectively interview a million tour operators, but I can't put an episode out every single day. So the frequency is there, then becomes an issue with podcasting. But I still do feel that when listeners are tuned in, they feel energized by what they're hearing because they really, we get an hour with someone. Mm -hmm. and I think that 
in an hour, you can go pretty deep. Whereas an ask me anything elsewhere can be 15, 20 minutes. I don't think you really scratch the surface. And you know what? Some people prefer that 15 minutes with so-and-so. I love going deep. I love having that hour. And actually, that's the tricky part with some podcast conversations is I have to edit them down because you go over the hour mark. Mm -hmm. You can go two, three hours. I mean, I remember the one with Tony Muir, Slice of Brooklyn Tours. I mean, we went way over two hours on that. But I knew I couldn't put, I'm not Joe Rogan. <laughs> I can't put out a three-hour podcast. Um, so that's tricky. Yeah, and whether this was intentional or not, I can say that as someone, I have a podcast and I have a YouTube channel. It's much harder to recruit guests to go on the YouTube channel because people yeah. are just less comfortable on video. And so you have so many great guests. And I think that having a podcast lets you invite those guests and lets them be comfortable and tell their story in a way that they might not be able to on video. That's very true. And also what comes with that is most tour operators that I interview are not media trained. Mm -hmm. And I work with them before we go on air. So I think it is easier knowing they're not on camera and that I'm editing in post-production. But it does present challenges sometimes because it does take a while. Even though I've never yet met a shy, quiet tour operator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're all quite gregarious. Uh -huh. um, but still... When, when someone's not media trained, there is that the minute you hit the record button or the minute you shove a mic under someone's nose, some of us freeze. Yeah. So speaking of recruiting guests and editing the shows, this is a question that a lot of people had when you asked for suggested questions in the Tourpreneur Facebook group. They wanted to know what goes into producing an episode. What are all the steps and how long does it take to go from idea to them listening to it in their ears? It does vary per guest. And the one thing that I, I, I spend a ton of time on, I know you do the same, Rob, is audio quality. Because as a podcaster, I'm not in an NPR studio with fast links and everything else. And my guest is not sat in the studio. My guest is sat, sat at home. We're working with their internet connection. More often than not, they don't have a mic. It's great to talk to you, Rob, because you have a studio quality mic. Most people are using internal mics. So that I'm a great fan of when you listen to a podcast, the quality has to be there. Mm -hmm. I will struggle through bad quality if it's a guest that I really want to hear. But 99% of the time, if it's a really bad, it's echoey or distorted or anything, you're not, you're not going to fight through that for an hour. So that, that does take a lot of time is working on dialogue isolates and things like that with audio. And then it's it's the research, it's reaching out to the guest, it's talking through the guest what the show will entail, it's it's getting time in the in the diary and the calendar which I must confess during covid has been much easier than ever before because we're all at home. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, people are out leading tours or they're at business meetings, so it's actually fixing that time. Then the research I put into the show. I'm very lucky with with tours because every tour has an about page. That's true. So I have a, it's not like I'm interviewing somebody who doesn't have an online presence. So I can kind of get my questions ready in advance. Uh, and then it's the, the hour interview. And of course, in the majority of cases, it's like you, you do the interview, but even though you only have an hour booked in, more often than not, you go two hours because the conversation carries on or you finish recording and then you chat off air. That happens a lot. And then the editing, the editing is the thing that takes the longest. And for quite a few months, I was doing this on my own, the editing, and I enjoy the process, but it's long. It can be arduous. And my goal with every interview is I want all my guests to sound great. What I strive to do with the show is this isn't NPR. It's not the BBC. This is as if you and I were having a coffee or having a beer or whatever, and we're having a chat and it's just being recorded. So I, I, I could estimate maybe four hours for every one hour of audio. But with someone like you, Rob, who's accomplished at this, it doesn't take long to edit because your audio quality is really good and you're used to speaking in public. So it can be less, but it really does depend on the guest and, and the audio quality. Yeah. And the reason why audio quality is so important uh, is because this is an audio first podcast. So we think of uh, media as being either word first, if it's a blog post or video first, if it's a YouTube video and a podcast is audio first, because that's the only way that you can really consume it. And so to have top notch quality is something that you strive for, because it's really important for people who are listening to have a good experience. And if you have poor quality, it's not gonna be a good experience. Yeah, I mean, if I went out to interview Richard Branson, let's say he was launching a tours OTA and he was on his island and it was poor connection, you, you probably will work with it because it's like, okay, it's Richard Branson. But for the average interview, you're going to go, yeah, 
I, I can't deal with that that quality, that lack of quality. And I actually had a really important lesson with this on another podcast I run, which is a history podcast. I interviewed the director of the DDR East Germany Museum in Berlin, and he was in his office, and something, and the audio was terrible. And I put it out, and the amount of complaints I got mm. because I was too scared to go back to him to say we need to do this again. And what ended up happening was he wrote to me and said the audio is awful. Why did you put this out? Let's do another one. So sometimes when it comes to audio, that is my my red line is if the audio is sounding really bad and I've had to do this a couple of times, I stop the interview and say, look, we need to work on your internet connection uh, or let's diagnose your machine or whatever, see if we can get this better. And if not, I've had to say, look, we can't do it. Yeah. So anyone who's an aspiring tourpreneur podcast guest, that's a good way of saying that investing in good quality audio is good if you're going to be guests on not just this, but but on other podcasts or you're going to be featured in media. And I know that maybe people are thinking about incre- improving their audio quality because we're doing so many Zoom calls and other virtual summits and such these days. But the, what you called my professional quality microphone is actually only a $50 microphone I bought on B&H. So it doesn't take that much. It doesn't take nearly as much as people think. My favorite mic is the ATR 2100. I think the first upgrade, I think that's 80 bucks. And what's funny is the very first episode of Tourpreneur, I ordered one and I sent it to the first guest because I'm like, this audio, I can't afford for this audio to be crap. And I paid the 80 bucks and sent them the mic and said, please use this microphone. Yeah. Because I knew that I needed good audio on episode one. Yeah. And episode one is great. So well done. So you're up to 99 episodes, not including this one. So which one is your favorite? Which one do you think turned out the best? Well, other than episode 32 with <laughs> you and I, let's take that one out of the equation, which actually I did enjoy because we talked about YouTube for tour operators, which is a question that comes up all the time. It's a bit like asking what your favorite pet is or your favorite child, I guess. Mm -hmm. So it's tricky, but I think looking back, the one that moved me the most was episode 19 with Tony Muir, Slice of Brooklyn Tours. Now, I was sat face-to-face with him. It's rare I get to do a face-to-face. And and he'd rented a WeWork in, in New York City. I'd gone on his tour and we sat down. And his story moved me because he was just so authentic about the challenges he'd faced. And in the moment when he told me that he broke down in his car, he had driven home thinking, God, I've lost my business. Numbers aren't there. I'm going to have to go back to working in the hospital. And it was such a powerful moment. And I know we've all been there with our businesses where maybe we've had a rough season or not enough bookings coming through. And you think, I can't afford to waste our family savings on, on my dream. You know, I love my business. I love my tours, but I just have to go and get a proper job. And that, that really moved me on an emotional level. And then Bulldog Tours episode nine, love John Laverne, love his whole story. And for me, it kind of encapsulates Tourpreneur because he he didn't go to school to study tourism. He did hospitality. Mm-hmm. He, I think he came out of the military and he just went to a few attractions in Charleston and said, hey, I want to lead these tours and I, I want to give you a cut of the, the, the revenue to help you with the preservation of the buildings. And I just thought, wow, that's it. That's, that's Tourpreneur. It's like, yeah, you're building a business educating people about your town or the history or whatever it may be. And he was helping those buildings as well. So that that was a powerful episode, episode nine. Yeah, I thought you were going to say Slice of Brooklyn simply because I think I've listened to all 99 episodes or almost all. I don't want to claim I have, but that was definitely the one that stuck with me, still sticks with me to this day. So I think that it's one that I definitely could have seen you claiming to be your favorite as well. But one thing that I like is that uh, it's not just about, you know, I take a lot of lessons away from the other tourpreneurs, but I also get inspiration for my own travels. So I went to Scotland this year and I went on the Cobble Tales tour tour because I had heard Olga on the podcast. And unfortunately she was out of town, but one of her other tour guides was fantastic. So yeah, it's great just to get to uh, meet virtually all these different people who otherwise I would have never, they, they probably wouldn't have been on my radar and I might not have done their tour. I really love it when listeners go on each other's tours and, and make friends and give feedback and everything else. Cause ultimately we all love a tour. We all love an experience. And the Tony one as well, this was actually a really tough decision. I did have to edit a lot of it out <laughs> because for Tony's safety and also because I didn't want to get sued. But the bit I did, ke- I kept him was when a competitor had ripped him off and he said, well, I was going to deal with the Brooklyn way. You know, I got my baseball bat out and my wife calmed me down. And I'm like, okay, probably I shouldn't include that. But then I decided I would because it's a human reaction. It was his reaction to having been stitched up by someone that he trusted. 
And that's horrible when that happens. And I always say that I love this industry because the vast majority of us want to help each other out, even helps us during COVID, getting together with competitors and, and helping each other out and learning from each other and supporting each other. There's not many industries like this. So to me to hear him talk about getting his baseball bat out was quite a moment. One day, maybe I'll release the full uncut edit interview and uh, we'll have some fun with that. So Tony, you said that you knew him because you went on that tour, but I imagine that you don't get to go on every single tour in the world and you haven't been on every tour of everyone who's been a guest. So where do you find your guests? Do you seek them out or do they come to you? Yeah, actually, Tony, I, I only found out about his tour through through social media. I saw his posts. I thought, oh, that looks like a fun tour. And it was because I'd lived in New York City, but I hardly ever went to Brooklyn. I kind of stayed on Manhattan. So I thought, well, that's a great way to go see Brooklyn. So I discovered him through social media. And most guests, actually, I see them pop up on social. I'm like, oh, that's a really cool tour. I, I curate the brief every day, and I'll read about a tourpreneur in the brief and think, oh, wow, yeah, she sounds interesting. Let me drop a note. And now I've got to the stage with tourpreneur, and it's a blessing and a curse where I get a lot of people write to me saying, I'm a big fan of the show. I listen in. I'd love to come on. Here's my story. And, of course, I just do one episode a week, so I, I can't get everybody on the show, certainly not timely. So that that's generally what's happening right now is I'm getting people approach me and I'm always looking for the story. I'm like, okay, you know what? I, always, I now I have a form that I ask guests to fill in, where they, I want them to listen to their three biggest learnings, how they overcome challenges, what nightmare situations have they had, because I think as as we go on this journey of building our tour business, we live each day, we seize that day, we lead the tour. I don't think we're very good at journaling our challenges or actually sitting down and really reflecting on our challenges. Maybe we are now during COVID because we have time to do so, but usually we're just thinking about the next day's tours. Our, our biggest win we felt with CheckFind is customers being able to book online and not have to make that phone call to us and they can just navigate our website, go through your interface and just book directly with us. Once we get into it and once they, once they see all the system can do, the, it's, uh, it's quite funny because you kind of see the, 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 the world open behind them before them and they're like, oh my God, and I can send emails and I can manage how many people come and I can check their means. I'd recommend using CheckFund because it's simple, it's straightforward, it's easy to use and most importantly, there are never any problems. Now, is there anyone who you want to have on the show, but you just haven't been able to get in touch with or they haven't agreed to it yet. Do you have a wish list? Do you have a list of people who you really want to have on the show, but just haven't gotten yet? The, the, the biggest challenge with the show is there are lots of people I want to interview, but I'm not so sure if the audience will want to hear mm. because I want it to be broad. And that's actually, again, a blessing and a curse with the industry that we are so fragmented. We are so broad. So for instance, I'd love to get a uh, spy museum on the show. Mm -hmm. The Spy Museum in DC, the German Spy Museum in Berlin, the Stasi Museum in Berlin. But these are all Shane interests, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, yeah, I, I want I have to be conscious that I want to make things broad. And challenge, I was talking to somebody last week who's also listens to most of the shows and said, he said, Well, I wasn't gonna listen to the show you had with the lady in Hong Kong because I'm in the Midwest. It's not really relevant to me. But I listened to it and I'm really glad I did because she was very inspiring and it was energizing to hear how she'd overcome some pretty big challenges. Yeah. So it's it's for me as the interviewer to say, well, okay, I'm going to interview somebody who's a boat tour operator, but I'm going to distill the lessons that we can hopefully apply across the board. Yeah. And that's exactly why I listen to every episode, even when the title isn't something that seems immediately relevant to me, because there's always those nuggets in there that you can take away and apply. Now, when you build an audience like you have, you always get people who come out of the woodwork and they contact you, and I get this too, and they want to come on your podcast because they want to sell something or they want to promote something. So I'm sure you get those. How do you handle those types of, of inquiries? I'll look at what they're offering. I'll ask a ton of questions. I certainly do my due diligence. My fear always is, I one of the things that I, I dread is somebody email me and saying, Shane, you had so-and-so on the show and I bought their product. What a load of crap. And I, I spent $400 on that because I trust you, Shane, and, and it was rubbish. So I always have that in the back of my mind. And there's, there's been quite a few people that I, I've read, I think only... Maybe one company I've had on, like Mitch at the Trip School, 
But even then, Mitch was like, I don't want to talk about my courses. And I, I was really curious how he built his business and what his background was. But even he was like, don't, I don't want to pitch my courses on this. I'm happy to share the story. I, I get a lot of people approach me about courses, whether it's SEO, digital marketing. And I'm like, look, first of all, I want to have a look at your course. And it's amazing. 95% of them won't give you free access. So they immediately get rejection. The ones that do, I'll, I'll open up the, the bonnet and take a look and see what it's about. If I think it's relevant and good good value, then I, I would consider inviting them on the show. As you can tell, because I haven't really done it yet, that doesn't happen so often either. And something that I've always said to people is, look, if you have a course, I'm happy to interview three of your graduates who are tour operators and have, and have applied learning from your course or from your book or from your coaching that they've applied to their business and it's helped grow in their business. What was really surprising to me and, and disappointing was when COVID hit, Boy, did the jackals come out. Yeah. Oh, like yeah. even now our tourpreneur group, oh, I'm doing free coaching on this. I'm doing free coaching on that. And I thought, okay, it's cool. People are like helping out. But then it amazed me how many of those people were then writing to me saying, Shane, can I get an hour of your time? I'd love to pick your brain because I want to know what the pain points are for a tour operator. And I'd write back and say, well, why are you offering coaching? If you don't know what the pain points are, like what's your background here? Oh, I'm an entrepreneur and this, that, and the other. I said, but what's your background in tours and even travel? And the vast majority of them didn't. It was like they kind of leapt onto this, oh, I can make money out of this. And yeah, it might have been a free 30-minute consult, but that horrible F word, the funnel would have come out and people would have been put in a funnel. And uh, that was it was amazing how many people I kicked off the group. But then I also saw people on social media saying this. And we were talking off air about a company that's advertising right now. Didn't they say they've one of their, their operators during COVID is 500? 500%, 500% during COVID. Un, not just completely unbelievable. Doesn't pass the smell test in any way. So it's hard because I'm sure there are products out there and there are services that, that are really good. And, and I'm really open to sharing that. And that's one of the reasons why I've built, and it's a version one, but the tourpreneur approved directory, because what I want there is, let's say you've hired someone, Rob, to do your digital marketing. Mm -hmm. they, did a, they did a brilliant job for you. I mean, to come on that group and you say, yep, yeah, I'm Rob, Trip Hacks DC. I hired so-and-so. They did this, they did that great company. So that I can then visit that directory if I'm in the market for a digital marketing person and go, oh, uh, Rob, let me email Rob and ask him you know, a couple of questions about that company. And I really want to grow that directory so our community can go there and buy with confidence rather than it's a, it's a bloody risk. Whenever you hire, I've been stung in the past. I've been stung quite, quite a few times, which is why I think I've got a nose for it now. There's nothing worse than losing money on somebody that promises you so much and delivers so little online. Yeah, and I, I personally will just say that I hate being sold to. I just absolutely hate it. I pay for YouTube premium because I don't want to see the ads. I get uh, pretty, you know, I don't go to those timeshare sales pitches, no matter how good the alleged benefit is. I just don't want to sit in a room and be sold to, and I don't want to listen to a podcast and be sold to. But I will say that. Uh, you have, and I don't want to watch a webinar and be sold to, which has happened uh -huh. a couple of times during COVID. Oh, I, I personally, when I hear webinar, the first thing I think of is sales pitch, not learning experience. So that's a, that's a problem for the webinar industry in general, but we'll save that for another time. I will say that Checkfront has been a sponsor of Tourpreneur, a lot of podcast episodes and daily briefs, and I am a customer of Checkfront. And it's probably because uh, I trusted Tourpreneur and saw that they were sponsoring. And because unlike some of their competitors, they didn't send their salespeople and their honestly questionable practices. But that's a challenge that you face is even though they're paying you for the advertising space, it's still an endorsement in the sense that you agreed to it, right? Like you could have said no, but you yeah. said yes. And so I think that's one of the things that people, when they listen they sort of need to understand is that maybe he's not fully endorsing it as the only one worth doing, but you chose to, to take on that arrangement. Yeah, I'm glad you, glad you brought it up for two reasons. First of all, quite frankly, without Checkfront, there would be no tourpreneur because I am trying to make a business out of this. They stepped up with, with tourpreneur to sponsor us, so that's been huge, as it was with Redeem and TRK Creative on the Daily Brief. Without sponsors, there would, there would be no tourpreneur. One of the things that really won me over with Checkfront, so the first time I started working with them was at Arrival Orlando, and we had this deal. They, they'd paid for me to have a booth, mm. and I did 20 interviews there. And they said to me, I said, look, send me over some Checkfront customers. I'd love to interview them. And they turned around and said, yeah, but we don't want all 20 interviews to be with Checkfront people, Shane. You need to mix this up. 
And I just looked around and thought, wow, you're a great company. Because most companies would have been like, oh, yeah, I only want you to interview our customers. Don't interview anybody else. And then when we talked about them sponsoring the show, I said, look, there's a few things you need to understand. First of all, I am going to interview people who are using your competitors and they're going to speak favorably of it. And there may be times I'll get someone on the show who's like, yeah, I worked with Checkfront and they didn't do this and they didn't do that. And you need to be comfortable with it. Because if not, I don't want you to sponsor the show because I don't want any bad blood later on. And they were so cool with it. And they're, they're such a great partner to work with. Um, so very, very, very grateful. And they're just good people. Yeah. So maybe that's not, uh, that's not to say I'm not open to future sponsorship, sponsorships from, from other res tech companies out there. So if you're listening today and you enjoy some of the benefits that Checkfront have enjoyed by working with Torpreneur, there are opportunities. Yeah. So, I mean, like I said, that's an, uh, that's a sale that they made from being a sponsor of Torpreneur, but also a lesson for their competitors that leaving me 10 voicemails a week can be more of a turnoff than actually trying to get me in the door. But anyway, you mentioned that, uh, there were some other sponsors. And so sponsorship is obviously one way that Turpreneur earns money. Does Turpreneur have any other income, uh, any other sources of revenue? So I get hit all the time by people, we just touched on it, with with courses and coaching and they want mm-hmm. to give me a commission. And some of those are really high, but I say no to them because unless I've tried it and I can really vouch for it, I don't want to go down that route. My business model is sponsorships. And that's out in the open. It's clear that they are a sponsor of a show. I did put a uh, buy me a coffee link on the daily brief because I know some people who will read the daily brief don't necessarily listen to the podcast and vice versa. And that that actually really surprised me, the amount of people who bought me a coffee. I was and First of all, I was really nervous putting it up there because I hate asking for money. I'm the worst salesman in the world. I'm the worst entrepreneur in the world because <laughs> I hate asking for money. But I thought I do have costs with the brief. And the more people who, as more people who join that mailing list, that the, the monthly price goes up. And I was really happy with the amount of people who chipped in five dollars for a coffee. Other than that, that I am not currently making uh, any revenue from any other uh, associations or affiliations. Well, I think people should appreciate how big of a deal that it is that you turn down those commissions because a lot of entrepreneurs, that's one of their main sources of revenue, if not their main source. And I actually lost respect for quite a few people when I started my business because I was doing all the standard due diligence, like how do I get a website? Who's the best web host? And a lot of people were recommending what turned out to be a completely garbage web host. And I only discovered after a year of suffering through the experience with this company that they pay the most generous commissions of all the web hosts. They pay something like $40 per referral. Yeah, And it just made me mad because it yeah. hurt my business and these people made their $40 off of me times however many that they refer. And I just lost a lot of respect. So I think that gives me even more respect for what you're doing because you're not taking the easy money because it would damage people's livelihoods potentially depending on what you're recommending. Yeah, absolutely. And it's the same with the, the Torpreneur directory. Quite a few people wrote to me and said, this is a phenomenal idea. It's totally needed, but you should be charging for it. Um, you should be charging for placement. And I said, you know what? Yeah, I probably should, but I don't want to because I also, uh, some people said, make it a PDF, get people to sign up, get them on your list. And I believe in email lists. Don't get me wrong. But I just didn't want to go down the funnel route. And I'm sick of being on, on funnels. I'm sick of getting these emails. I this morning from someone, I'm like, why am I on that email list? I didn't sign up for that. It's probably some book I've signed up for in the past. So I always wanted the approved directory to be free of charge as my gift to the industry, mm-hmm. as someone who's been burned in the past. And I'm talking four figures burned with certain products and packages online. I wanted that directory just to be free. And yeah, maybe in the future, if it really grows and I need to add functionality, to it, maybe there'll be a sponsor at the top of it. Maybe I will go down that route because right now it's very basic because I'm paying for it myself mm-hmm. and it's a V1. I and mean, there's a lot of bells and whistles I'd love to add to it, but that's going to cost. But fundamentally, I didn't want it to be a funnel. I didn't want it to be a PDF. You get an email. I want you to go to the website, get what you need and, and go and do your business. Yeah, that's fantastic. So COVID-19 is a topic that's been in the podcast a lot the last four months. It's impacted all of us tour operators, some pretty significantly financially. And so I'm wondering, how has Tourpreneur, how has COVID-19 impacted Tourpreneur? Massively, to be honest. So I was in London when this really hit. I was supposed to have gone to Rival for Berlin. I was at the gate for my flight when it got canceled. And then the following week, I had to go to London. And I'm flying back to Montreal, I'm like, wow, that, that's Torpreneur gone. 
because uh, the whole ethos of tourpreneur is you you listen to a tourpreneur talk you through how they started their business, how they grew their business, how they dealt with nightmare situations, etc. And I thought, well, who on earth, A, wants to come on the show and talk about their business that right now has got zero revenue, is closed down. Nobody wants to do that. And nobody wants to listen to that either. So I thought, I'm done. I'm out of here. And it took me a couple of weeks where I felt really kind of out of it. I think we all did. I was unsure what my next steps would be. I was trying to read the room as well because I didn't want to be tone deaf. I mean, you look at Viator. We're in the worst crisis we've had in our lifetimes. And they go and slap a $29 fee on uploading products. I mean, read a room, guys. And I didn't want to be doing anything and being tone deaf. But then again, and I picked up the phone, I spoke to tour operators and they're like, well, I just want to know how, how other people are coping. And, and here's the thing, Rob, each day I try and speak to a handful of tour operators every day, just a quick check in, how are things going? And I'm lucky to have that access, but most tour operators don't. They're at home, they're looking at zero revenue, they're looking at bills coming in, they're panicking. And some operators said, can you just do quick check-ins with people? And I thought, okay, let's give that a go. I wasn't sure how it, how it would be received. And phenomenal amounts of downloads on those episodes because A, they were short. They were like, I tried to keep them short. They ended up going a bit longer, but I started off around 10 minutes because I really wanted it to be basically me calling an operator, having that very quick chat. And the community really enjoyed those. And I got a lot of very positive feedback from saying, listening to those shows is keeping me going, quite frankly. Yeah. So that was the pivot for Tourpreneur. I am getting to a stage now, I think, as as in some areas, it depends where you are in the world, but if probably you could have a drink in England this weekend in a pub for the first time in months. I want to bring back those stories, the, 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 the hour-long deep dives into tour operator businesses. But if we get that second wave or we don't recover, then I, I, I don't know. You, you have, as a media content provider, you have to pivot and read the room. In a way, because of COVID, we're all starting again. And so there will be many startup stories in the future because whatever happens, anyone who survives COVID will have their own story about how they made it through and how they started back up. So I think the material will be there for sure. But you mentioned the community and I know that you have the Tourpreneur Facebook group. So how did that come to be? Was that always part of the Tourpreneur brand? Was that always tied in the way that you imagined it? No, not at all. I kind of set it up as the bonus content on a DVD. You watch a movie, then you can watch an interview with a director and how they made it. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool to have a community where folks would come in and if there's a question I haven't asked the guest that they could ask mm -hmm. there, or I could go and say, hey, I'm interviewing Rob next week. He's a YouTube guy. What questions have you got? Because I recognize, again, I'm very privileged to have this access to speak to people such as yourself, Rob, and others. And uh, I wanted to kind of open that and widen it for, for the community. What I didn't expect was it's almost at 2,000 right mm -hmm. now. Some phenomenal posts. I mean, I work really, really hard at uh, removing spam making sure that every post has some kind of learning or education for us. And uh, I mean, there was an interaction the other day, I think it was Peter, Simon, Nathan, just talking about their Facebook ads. And those guys were so open with their numbers, what they were doing, their conversion rates. And I'm, I'm watching this mouth open thinking, wow, this is what I'm so pleased. This is what the group has become. It's not just, hey, come and buy my tours or hey, come and buy my course. It's like, well, here's my Facebook stats. What else can I do? Uh, and, and I've just constantly amazed at how, uh, how the posts are, how the interaction are, and, and the way there is a community spirit on the group as mm -hmm. well. And I think I learned this early on. I've got to give credit here to Douglas Quimby. When I first started Torpreneur and we got chatting, and uh, I said, I don't know if this is going to work, Douglas. He said, why? I said, well, I'm basically asking operators to come on the show and share their secret sauce. And he's like, no, it's definitely going to work because operators want to help other operators. And then the other day, so I'm commissioning a, a journalist to write a piece for us on uh, pricing of private tours, because as we know, there's going to be a lot of demand, or we think there's going to be a lot of demand for private tours, and they have to come at a premium cost to make those profitable for each operator. And I know a lot of operators are going to struggle to come up with pricing. Mm -hmm. And we asked on the group, and I said, we're writing this article, can we get in touch with you if you're running private tours, we'll ask you about pricing. I think we had like 25 people right in saying, yep, this is my private tour, happy to talk to you. And the journalist I commissioned, which wasn't cheap, by the way, because she's an accomplished mm -hmm. writer. And this kind of writing, you don't just, you know, knock it up in an afternoon. And I, this is something I'm trying to do with tourpreneurs, not just to come out with theory, but go and speak to 10 tour operators who've built their own private tours and ask them how they've priced it up and then distill that either into a podcast or in this case into a blog post. 
just amazed that so many people are so willing to help. Yeah, I agree. I saw the number of people who responded to that post and I was pretty blown away myself. And so it's great that people, it's not just you, you're not the mo- the moderator of everything. Although I think it is worth saying that those Facebook groups do take a lot of work to moderate yeah. because I'm a member of some. And if it doesn't have a strong leader, it just devolves into chaos and spam and people yelling at each other. And so it takes a lot of work to keep it a quality, wholesome community. But I think you've definitely nailed it so far. Thank you. Uh, as we reach 2000, I'm going to be looking for some moderators because it is now getting to the point where it's kind of getting too big to handle. And we we prune a lot of posts that are spam or shouldn't be in the group. But I have a, I guess I'm, I'm strict. I, it's an instant red card. The minute you spam, you're out. There's no discussion because the rule is clear in, in the, you know, the, no spam rule is clear in the guidelines and the rules. So I'm just like, yeah, you're yeah. gone. Because that's not, that's not what the group is about. The group is there to flatten the learning curve for tour operators. That's the whole mission is we want to learn from each other. You offering your tours in DC isn't really helping somebody in London, but you coming on and saying, hey, I've just made this video Mm -hmm. for my tours and 10x my bookings and this is what I did. That's value. And that's what I want to see. Absolutely. Well, let's um, pull the curtain back a little bit. Shane Whaley, the host of Tourpreneur. I want to know a little bit about some of the things you mentioned earlier, like the hobby casts that you talked about. I think you said you have two, what you call hobby casts. So what are they and yeah. what are they about? So the first one I set up just over three years ago called Spybrary. And that is a podcast all about spy books, movies, and TVs, both fiction and nonfiction. And, and that came about because I love the genre. I love spy history, but none of my friends like it. My family don't particularly like it. They'll watch the old James Bond movie, but that's as, as far as it gets. And I thought, wow, I, I just re- read this series of books. There was nine of them written by the great spy writer, Len Dayton. And I just set this podcast up, got chatting to other people who ran these websites. And here we are now, I think something like 115 episodes. I did start that off weekly, but uh, now it's uh, just because of Torp and everything else, it's about once every mm-hmm. two weeks. And that's really grown and that spawned its own community as well. We've had meetups all over the world. Wow. I've made some fantastic friends through that. I even got to to correspond with some spy writers who I, I really admire. Even got to interview a former KGB agent who was who lived undercover for 20 years in the United States and he was a consultant on the Americans TV show. And I'm like, when am I ever knowingly going to speak to a KGB agent? Uh, <laughs> I mean, maybe I spoke to a few of them on my travels, not knowing. But so that's Spybury, which which is fantastic. And then I started another one last year called Radio GDR because I'm a history nerd, and uh, GDR German Democratic Republic, so the history of East Germany, the life and times of East Germany. And again, that spawned quite the community. I think we have 1,500 in that group. We had a meetup in Berlin last November. And 25 people showed up from all over all around the world. Yeah, it was phenomenal. We had this three day of talk about tours. We went with a specialized Trabant tour. They organized a custom tour for us and just phenomenal. So I've, I've really enjoyed those podcasts, but I will be honest, the, the frequency is uh, lower now than it used to be because I'm doing Tourpreneur. Mm-hmm. And then when I worked at Get Your Guide, the Spybury project, was it was fun to edit. And it was fun to prep and it was fun to you know, do the interviews. It still is fun, but it kind of feels like the day job. Yeah. So they're, they're not as often as I, and in fact, Radio GDR, I had a couple of months off. I'm launching season two. That's, that was something I think if I had uh, regrets about Tourpreneur, I kind of wish I, I had launched as seasons because then you're entitled to take a month or two off before the next season right. launches. Okay. So if we were to take a look at Shane's iPhone or Android phone or whatever you have and pull up the podcast app. Would we find a bunch of spy stories and history podcasts? What other podcasts uh, are you subscribed to? Yeah, it's it's a real mix. So my routine every morning is I work out and during my warm down, I listen to the daily skift from, from the media site skift to know what's going on with it, with the, the industry. I always listen to the Wall Street Journal minute briefing. Mm-hmm to get an idea of what's happening in the news. Listen to some local news podcasts as well. I'm just going to scroll here. I've got Agents of Change, which is a SEO social media podcast. Ask the Podcast Coach, because I'm obviously striving to be a better podcast constantly. Broadcast journalism, some soccer stuff, some history stuff. There's the Joe Rogan experience, which I probably listened to one in 20 of those. I have to be really invested in the guests to give that a go. 
but yeah, it's it's a mix of politics, economics, history, spy, not yeah, too, and travel. Not too dissimilar from my own mix of podcasts, and and I think something that um, some people might know. I don't think you've you know announced this widely. Is that you don't just host the Tourpreneur podcast, but you are actually in the early stages of being a tourpreneur yourself. So you live in Vermont, and I think you have something cooking up there. So what can you tell us about that project at this point? Yeah, I did until COVID hit. I was quite serious about it. So for some time, I'm a big fan of IPAs. and uh, India Pale Ales for people who aren't into beer. <laughs> And Vermont, I mean, I've put a serious amount of weight on since I've moved up here because the local beer is just phenomenal. <laughs> and in Vermont, we have one tour company, Great Tour Company, based in Burlington, which is the major city, and they hit most of the breweries up there and occasionally out to Stowe. But for my money, the best breweries are outside <laughs> of Burlington. So the county I live in has four or five breweries, which are phenomenal. And it just dawned on me. I thought a lot of beer fans come to Vermont, a lot of skiers come to Vermont that want to go on these tours is there a gap in the market for uh, what I actually called, and this is a big thanks to to Mitch and Alan at thetripschool.com, called Beyond Burlington Tours. Because the use of that word beyond is, I don't want to compete with the guys in Burlington. They do a phenomenal job. I'm not competing with them. I want to offer people, either they, they've gone on the Burlington Tours, then it's like, oh, well, let's try the ones a bit further afield. And also to do something for the county where I live in, especially now, post-COVID, where we're really struggling down mm -hmm. here. So that, that was an idea I had, the beer tour, the brewery tour. And I actually, again, paid good money to go on Mitch's trip school. He had a how to start a tour business. And this is the thing. It was this started in June. I think there were 25, 20 to 25 of us in that class. And the course is 600 bucks, not cheap. Mm -hmm. Uh, but still, even in the middle of depressing COVID, you've got 20 plus people out there that want to start a tour business. Uh, and it's one of the courses that I will say hand on heart because I've paid for it. And Mitch even said, hey, I'll let you have this as a freebie so you can test drive it. I'm like, you know what? I'd rather pay for it because if it's crap, I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, I wanted want to support it. But going through that course was really good. That really helped me with the idea of Beyond Burlington Tours. And just the, the cool thing about wanting to build my own tour business is whenever I'm interviewing someone for the show, that is at the back of my mind. So the questions I'm asking, how did you know that there was going to be demand for the tour? How did you deal with buses? How do you deal with tour guides? Uh, how do you deal with marketing? They're questions selfishly that I really have myself for when I want to launch my tour. Now, I had hoped to launch it in 2021, but because of COVID, it might be 2022 now. I just want to, I, I'd be, it'd be silly of me to put my meager resources into that until we got an idea of how things are going. Yeah. Yeah, I know uh, there was just a big article in the Washington Post about how the Maine, state of Maine tourism industry is getting hammered. And I assume being your next door neighbor, it's probably similar in Vermont. Yeah, it's a big struggle. I think where Vermont and Maine are kind of lucky is that a lot of the things to do here are mm -hmm. outdoors. So I think people are going to come here to do, I mean, just on the lakes, I saw some people out kayaking and on boats and everything else that at least with it being outdoors activities, and the governor has started to open up now. Vermont has been very, very careful about opening up to out of staters mm -hmm. but who knows what's going to happen over the coming months. It would be silly for me to launch, but it's not silly for me to plot and plan. And I've spoke to members of the business community down here, one of our local, uh, it's called a city, but it's a <laughs> village called Vigens. And uh, you know, I spoke to some entrepreneurs down there and business owners about things that we could do in terms of bringing the tour in, where they could go and eat and do various things. There's some really nice ice cream places down there as well. So I think it would be a really cool tour, but just not. Well, right when now. you told me that there were 20 people in that course, at first I thought, who the heck would would do this? Just ran the numbers for Trip Hacks DC. Our first six months of 2020, sales are down 87 or 88 percent from 2019, right? So that's devastating. But this is, and that's also in a year that was supposed to be a growth year. So to not just be mm -hmm. flat, but to be down 87 percent is. It's terrible. But then I was thinking it might be easier to start now because you're just thrilled to get one tour. If you get one tour a month, like that's awesome. Whereas if we got one tour a month when we used to be getting 50, that's terrible. So and maybe it's actually easier to start right now than it you know, is to uh, have witnessed what we did. What I've learned through doing Tourpreneur, and I saw this one as I like, get your guide, is most people who launch a tour company are not doing it to make millions. 
most people are doing it, but it's, it's around a passion. And if we can do that and make a couple of quid to keep our heads above water, we're happy. And that, again, is the beauty of the Torpreneur podcast, the people I'm talking to. that what they're, they're getting up every morning and it doesn't feel like a job. It's like, yeah, I'm going to need a tour of my city today or I'm going on this architecture tour, whatever it may be. They, they want to do it. They want to show it off. They want to educate people and have fun with, with the guests and make a few quid as well, as opposed to, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to make this and sell it off and make millions of dollars. I mean, there are those people out there, but I, I learned really early on with Torpreneur because I initially had this idea of, I'd interview the heads of the OTAs and, and all that. But Arrival do a really good job mm-hmm. of that. I don't really need to get into that territory for me. Because when it, this is something else I would say to people who might even want to start their own podcast. You have to have the interest there. Don't just do it because you think you can make money or you'll be a celebrity. And for me, it's always like, okay, why did you build this company, this tour, knowing you weren't going to make a ton of money? And it was you'd be people out there right now having to work 18 hours a day because they can't afford tour guides or operations staff or ground staff and having to do it themselves. Or you get some of your tour guide calls in sick and you've got to go and lead it yourself. This is it's a really tough job, what we do, for little money. Uh, and that fascinates me. Okay, so this is episode number 100 of the Tourpreneur Podcast. So what's your vision? For the next 100 episodes or the next 1,000 episodes, what, where do you see it going from here? Yeah, that's a good question. I have, as I always do, been asking members of the community what they want to hear more of and hear less of. And what I hear is more roundtables. And we've got a couple that are coming out over the next couple of weeks. And we did one with, with Blend, which I, I thoroughly enjoyed. More roundtable discussions, getting back to the basics of Tourpreneur, which is the one-hour deep dive with an operator about how they grew. Also, requests for more education. And we certainly saw that around the Facebook ad thread recently. I still haven't quite decided how we do that in podcast form, whether we video it and I put the audio out on podcasts, we make a video available, et cetera. Um, but these are, these are the areas. And I, and I guess there's a million tour operators, they say, out there. Could Tourpreneur go to three episodes a week? Because I want Tourpreneur to be a smorgasbord. I want you to rock up to the table and say, oh, I really want to listen to that interview with the boat tour operator because that's what I'm in. Oh, and wow, there's an interview with the sales director from the Van Gogh Museum. That might be interesting. So you, you can kind of pick and mix what you want to listen to. And, and maybe it is time, if I can get enough sponsors on board and resources, where Tourpreneur does go to two or three episodes a week. And we have education pieces, we have roundtables, and we have more tour operator stories. Yeah, I will say that it's really great that you've experimented with so many different concepts. You've done the one-hour deep dives. You've done the... 10 minute espresso shots, as you called them, and you did the COVID check ins. And so, a lot of times in life and in business, you don't know what's going to work. You just have to try and test. And if something sticks, it's great. And if it doesn't, you just let it go. And so, I think it's really cool that you've been able to try all these different concepts over the first 99 episodes. Very lucky in this day and age to have data uh, that you can look at and you can see what was more popular, what wasn't popular, what worked, what didn't work, et cetera. Uh, we're very, and that's the same with, with Facebook ads or any kind of online advertising, as opposed to sticking an ad in a newspaper, studying those stats, but also asking people whenever uh, I see somebody at an event, they go, I love your show. And I, the, the thing I always say to all the time is do me a favor. If you're listening to an episode and you're screaming at me to ask a question of the guest and I don't ask it, please put it in an email. I'll never be offended. That's how I learn as an interviewer. I want to make sure I'm asking the questions that you're dying to hear are the answers for. So like put that in an email. And I would say that to anybody listening now, I'm sure there's times we've gone, oh, I can't believe he didn't ask so-and-so about that. Email me. That's I didn't go to journalism school. I am studying journalism right now with the National Council for the Training of Journalists back in the UK, which is something I wanted to do when I was 18. But I'm, I'm learning with each week. And uh, the feedback is really, really, you know, it's crucial to the growth of the show. Yeah, and I think that's worth saying is that when you listen to mostly the big time podcasts, the NPR podcasts or the Joe Rogan or whatnot, if you email them, it will go into a black hole and no one will ever get back to you. And so I think people sometimes get conditioned to think, well, they're they're too big. They're too important. They're never going to get back to me. And that's not true at all. I try to respond to every single no. message that comes through by email or on my YouTube channel or whatnot, because I don't want to be seen as like the person who's too big to or too important. And and I get that because I just reached out to a traveling uh, YouTuber and asked if 
uh, they'd be willing to work together if they came through town and they just never got back to me. They just uh, never responded. And so it's easy, I think, when you only follow like the big, big names to think that, oh, you're never going to get a response. But that's not true at all. So definitely send in your feedback, post it on the Facebook group, email it, however you need to get it. Because podcasts, that's one thing is that it's hard to leave a comment on a podcast compared to other mediums. But definitely send it in. It is. It is. And, and I would say as well, sometimes I don't get back to people and it's not because I don't want to. It's just you get a flurry of emails and when you're doing everything yourself, as all entrepreneurs know, um, you can't always, you don't, sometimes an email will go astray. And in that case, I would say, keep emailing me. It's not that I don't want to reply. It's just, I haven't got, got to it. And I would say also that doing tourpreneur, I've had to get a lot better at productivity mm-hmm. and, and project management and planning because I don't have a team. I do have, I've, I, I, I've outsourced to an editor now just because that frees up some time. I have just hired a show notes writer because, again, I asked the group, I said, do you want transcripts? Because they can cost 50 bucks a throw. What do you want? And people said, we want detailed notes with with all the links. So I've hired someone to do that because it can free me up then to go and interview someone else or do research or whatever else, which is the parts I really enjoy doing. So are there productivity tips that you think translate into what we do as tour operators? Yeah, I mean, it's Sunday. So tonight I will sit down and I will write out my three big goals for the week. Like the three, these must get done. I will write those down and then at the end of every day, so what I'll also do for tomorrow is write down the three daily goals of things I have to get done or I have to achieve. And I will do that every morning. I will write up those. Actually, I do it the night before. That's another tip I learned a while ago. Rather than do it on the morning of because email can distract you and everything else. So I'll sit down Monday night. I'll review my three. Did I get to them? I don't always. So they may go across the next day or like, okay, what have I got to do tomorrow? And then at the end of the week, I'll do like an after action report. I'll look at my goals and say, where did I get to? What did I achieve? What can I do better this week? That What do I need to change? So maybe I spent too much time mucking about on Facebook instead of actually writing a blog post or whatever. Just trying to hold myself accountable and being as productive as I can with, again, the meager resources that I have because I don't have a team uh, in order to put out a really good product. Well, those are great tips. And I think some of them definitely apply to those of us without big teams, uh, for sure. Yeah, and there's tons of these out there now, journals and planners. I use one, it's a Full Focus Planner by Michael Hyatt. He has a podcast mm-hmm. as well. He also, I think he runs Platform University. Uh, and I've just found it was a, the, the three weekly goal and the three daily goal, just massive. Well, Shane, I just want to say congratulations again on 100 episodes. And thank you uh, for allowing me to come and be the guest host of this episode. It was quite the pleasure to be able to come back to Tourpreneur, not just as a guest, but as the actual host. So thanks a lot for that. Well, I want to thank you. I'll often run an idea past you, Rob. Say, how fancy doing this? And you might say, well, actually, as a smaller tour operator, I'm not that interested in it. Or can you tweak it and do something else? I value that feedback. And that's what makes the show where it is. I'm just lucky enough to be the guy to ask the questions. But really, it is the feedback from the community that makes the show better week on week. Yeah. And as, uh, as we often say in podcasting, if you made it this far then you probably really like the podcast. So it would be a great honor if you could go and leave a rating and review in the podcast app where you're listening to it right now. See, you're a pro. I don't even say that when I do the show. You do do sometimes. (laughs) I will give you credit for that. A big thank you to Rob and a big thank you to you, tourpreneurs, each and every one of you that tunes in to the show. I'm just very grateful that you spend an hour or so a week with us. Your support, your downloads, your emails, your shares on social, your likes, sustain the Tourpreneur podcast. And it's going to sustain me to go for another, hopefully, 100 episodes. And as I talked about in this episode, expertly hosted by Rob, um, I really do thrive on your feedback. So if there are subjects that you want me to focus more on or guests that you want to come on, um, or if you do feel that there is a question I didn't ask that you really wanted me to, drop me a line, shane at tourpreneur.com. Uh, it's um, an interesting one being interviewed. I am actually quite shy, believe it or not. And I definitely prefer to be the one asking the questions. As much as it was fun today to share a little bit about the story behind Tourpreneur, I'm not comfortable with that. And I do feel quite awkward because. I thrive on sharing your story 
and sharing your strategies for success and sharing how you overcome a nightmare situation. So that is what Tourpreneur is all about. If you've enjoyed today's show, if you've enjoyed the previous 99, please do consider sharing it with your peers. I'd love to get more people listening to the show because the more people who listen, the more people we can help flatten that learning curve for tour operators. And you help me because more sponsors will be interested in uh, sponsoring the show, which will allow me to continue to do this. And hey, what do you think about this idea of going two or three times a week? Do you want more episodes? Do you want that smorgasbord, that buffet of content that would allow you to pick and choose what you're interested in. Let me know, shane at tourpreneur.com or join our Facebook group over at tourpreneur.com forward slash Facebook. Thanks for listening to the Tourpreneur podcast. Be sure to visit tourpreneur.com to join the conversation and access the show notes, including links to the resources mentioned on today's episode. This is Tourpreneur.